So thank you, Bruce. Uh, it's uh, uh, actually very exciting to be here. I've been at the Beckman several times, but usually uh, sitting on the other side of the fence uh, uh, on review panels, uh, uh, trying to dig holes in, uh, in, in the program here. So it's nice to, it's nice to come. It's nice to come as a friend, and it's particularly nice to come in the context of uh, a, um, a memorial lecture uh, in tribute to, to Alan. Uh, who is a very special person, and it's, it's uh, delightful to meet uh, uh, Stephanie and, and, and Jennifer here. Uh, as Bruce said, Alan was a, a luminary in, in, in the field of photomedicine, and I, I got to know him uh, quite well uh, through uh, uh, his work at Roswell Park over many years. And uh, I uh, was always very impressed. Alan showed this picture, and I've used it very many times, actually, to demonstrate uh, that PDT really works. This was a, uh, an individual who had uh, <coughs> received uh, spinal irradiation as a child, and uh, um, decades later uh, uh, turned up with this strip of, of, of uh, cancers uh, along the whole of the belly. That represents the exit beam of the radiation field. Uh, and uh, that would be a horrendous uh, situation to deal with by, by any standard uh, 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 treatment. Uh, and so Alan uh, uh, demonstrated in, 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 in this case the ability to essentially uh, eradicate uh, that disease in what was otherwise a, an un unmanageable situation. And I think that sort of <coughs> represents uh, Alan's work in, in, in uh, 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 it takes some courage. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to use a new technique uh, on a case like that. So for anyone in the audience who is not aware, uh, photodynamic therapy, as Bruce said, is the use of uh, drugs activated by light. Uh, and uh, that can uh, be used either in therapeutic mode, as, as shown here in the treatment of a, a lesion on, on the lip, or the fact that many of the drugs are also fluorescent <coughs> upon being activated by light can be used uh, in imaging mode, and I'll talk about that uh, more at the, at the end here. This is a very nice uh, uh, summary slide or summary diagram uh, from, from uh, the MGH group published recently in Nature Reviews of Cancer, uh, showing uh, the idea of the photophysical activation of the molecule in PDT, the generation of uh, highly reactive singlet oxygen, and then the various and increasingly complex, <coughs> uh, increasingly interesting mechanisms of biological uh, effect, uh, both uh, in terms of cell death, uh, vascular shutdown, and also immune modulation. So I thought uh, I was struggling a little as to how to pitch this talk, uh, give, given it's a fairly general audience. So I thought what I'd do is uh, select four or five um, uh, topics from within our PDT and PDD uh, research program uh, and uh, sort of talk about both those at the sort of middle level of, of, of detail rather than telling you a little about everything or, or, or a lot about uh, uh, just one. So uh, just to, to set the landscape, uh, <coughs> we've been doing PDT research for the last 30 years actually uh, and this can be broken down into preclinical studies. Uh, we started off this uh, uh, work in this area uh, trying to uh, improve PDT dissymmetry, and I'll show you uh, an example of the present status of that. We've had a lot of interest in trying to improve PDT specificity, uh, because although uh, the combination of drug and light targeting does give you an unusual degree of control, uh, it's still not uh, as, as specific as one would like. Uh, I'll give you an example of what we would call precision PDT, in the use of two photon uh, uh, activation. And uh, a, uh, I'll talk a little about PDT in bone, <coughs> which is an area that we got involved in through an orthopedic surgical resident a number of years ago. It was an area that had never been looked at, and it's turning out to be surprisingly fruitful. So I'll give you some examples in the preclinical side. On the clinical side, we, we did a lot of work on gliomas. I, I won't talk about that here today since that's not something that we're currently uh, doing, although we're going to ramp up again. Barrett's esophagus, we've done some work in. Prostate cancer, I'll show you one slide of. And then I'll talk a little about um, the use of photodynamic uh, fluorescence image-guided resection. 
uh, I wanted to emphasize that although I've listed these as preclinical and clinical, uh, it has been characteristic of our program that uh, it's a very much a two-way uh, uh, flow, uh, so that uh, really most of the preclinical work we have done has been stimulated, motivated by specific clinical objectives. Uh, and hopefully the preclinical work has some impact on improving the clinical side. So let me start off with, uh, so I'm going to do, do sort of I've ordered these various topics from sort of very fundamental through to, through to clinical. Uh, so the translation from, from, from the concept level through, through to the clinic. Uh, so I'll start with two photon PDT, which I'll call precision PDT. Uh, two photon activation of molecules was first described by Maria uh, Gopert Meyer, uh, for which she won the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics, the real Nobel Prize, not the Nobel Prize, uh, in 1963. <coughs> and uh, so this was a sort of a crazy idea uh, that we had. That maybe we should try to do two photon PDT because Maria Gopert Meyer showed that molecules can, ex can absorb two photons simultaneously and be activated. <coughs> And the idea is, is illustrated here, and this is uh, uh, used routinely now in confocal fluorescence microscopy, uh, but we were interested in using it therapeutically. So a normal one photon activation of a molecule, the ground state of the molecule is here. You absorb a photon of light, it's excited to an electronic state, de-excites, and you get uh, uh, fluorescence. So if you take a cuvette of fluorescent dye and you put a laser beam into this, you will see that there is fluorescence all along that beam. <coughs> as the light propagates uh, through the dye. In two photon excitation, you use uh, two photons of uh, each of half the energy, in other words, twice the wavelength of the single photon, so we're in the infrared. Uh, those two photons are absorbed simultaneously uh, uh, by, by the molecule. After that, the molecule doesn't know any difference from how it was original, uh, from the one photon. It de-excites and gives off fluorescence. The difference here, however, is that the probability of this, since this is two photons, uh, uh, is actually quadratically dependent on the intensity. And so if you use a very high intensity, uh, you can essentially get spatial confinement of the, of, 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 of the activation. So rather than getting this uh, 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 line of fluorescence, you restrict the activation of the molecule to a single point, <coughs> diffraction limited single point. From the PDT perspective, the molecule uh, can undergo intersystem crossing to a triplet state, exchange energy with ground state oxygen, leading to singlet oxygen, which does photodynamic cell kill. So the question is, could we kill cells there without killing cells throughout the rest of the tissue? Uh, in order to do this, uh, you need ultra-short pulse lasers typically 100 frames per second, because you need to produce a very high instantaneous intensity without a large amount of energy being deposited. And secondly, <coughs> you need photosensitizers with very high two-photon cross-section, because this is a very improbable process <laughs> that two photons will be absorbed simultaneously. And so you need uh, special drugs that have high two-photon cross-section with low one-photon absorption at wavelengths that have large penetration depth in tissue. So the idea is, could we selectively get two photon activation without having a lot of one photon activation background? <coughs> and so uh, it, we started this uh, about five or six years ago, uh, asking the question, well, could we just use a current clinical photosensitizer, especially one that's FDA approved, because that would make life a lot easier to move into the clinic. And so if you take photoporin or vertoporphyrin uh, and you measure the normal one photon absorption spectrum, you get these sort of peaks. Here's the, here's the typical peak used for photon for an activation, and here's a nice big peak for vertoporphyrin that's used for macular degeneration. And if you measure the two photon cross section, you find, of course, it's way out here because the wavelength is essentially doubled. And uh, you get these values, and these, these don't mean much to you uh, at, at, at the moment, but not, just note that these values measured in so-called Gopert-Meyer units, after, after Maria Gopert-Meyer GM units, are a few tens of GM units. Uh, so if you uh, take a uh, suitable femtosecond laser beam and increase the intensity, you expect for one photon activation that the uh, fluorescence intensity will just linearly increase with the intensity of the excitation beam, and that's indeed true. But however, if you get two photon activation, 
this should increase quadratically because it should go as i squared. And so the slope of this line should be about 2, and it does. It turns out these measurements are actually extraordinarily difficult to make, so there's a lot of work hidden <laughs> in, in, in that simple curve. But uh, anyway, the principle is really straightforward. So it works in solution. Does it work in cells? And so this was a study in which we took a, uh, let's see if that movie will run, <coughs> in which we took a uh, two-photon confocal microscope, uh, made uh, monolayers of vascular endothelial cells, because I'm going to tell you that we're particularly interested in this for vascular targeting, and essentially did two-photon activation, and you see uh, the cells dying here, lifting off, lifting off the plate. Uh, and you can measure uh, the uh, effectiveness of the kill, and plot cell survival curve versus this is the light exposure, and this shows that you get uh, uh, these survival curves, and if you plot some measure of survival, such as the 50% survival as a metric of, of, of uh, efficacy, again, versus the, the, uh, the power, you find that we get two photon excitation, a slope of two in cells. So this is the first time that two photon excitation had ever been explicitly demonstrated in a living, in a living system. So it does indeed translate from solution to, uh, uh, to cells, uh, and uh, here's cell, uh, cell viability versus a light dose, and it just shows you that actually Visudine uh, is, is a much more effective two-photon sensitizer than photofren. The cross-section accordingly uh, is, is higher, uh, but there's a nasty little point hidden here is that uh, this is a light dose, and a typical light dose required for one photon excitation the way down there. So this appears to be an extraordinarily inefficient process. Uh, <coughs> so then the question is, well, how do we make this better? So if you look at the basic equation that's proportional to the, to the cross-section and I squared, the obvious thing would be, well, let's just bump up the intensity. If, if we have a, 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 a low efficiency situation, let's bump, bump up the intensity. And that indeed is what was done here. So this is the same monolayer of cells. Uh, with a very high intensity in the gigawatts per square centimeter range, and you see we can kill the cells. Unfortunately, this is without a photosensitizer. <laughs> so this is photochemical, photomechanical damage, cell, cell death, and we completely lose the selectivity of PDT. And in fact, it turns out that you have a rather narrow therapeutic window here, a narrow uh, uh, window of opportunity uh, to do two-photon PDT without causing two-photon photomechanical damage. So this is not going to work. So all we're left with is sigma-2. Can we find drugs that have a very high two-photon cross-section? And this is a plot of uh, the cross-sections for some different drugs. So here's photofrin and visudine uh, with, with you know, uh, cross-sections in order of tens of GM units. A group in Montana, Charlie Spangler, uh, developed a very elegant molecule that has uh, two front cross-section in the hundreds. And then we collaborated with a group at Oxford University in the UK who produced this uh, 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 porphyrin dimer. And it's interesting that photofrin are porphyrin dimers. Uh, but in fact, the way that you connect these molecules is critical because the two photon cross-section comes from the linking between these two molecular structures in a way that I actually don't understand, but uh, somebody does. Uh, and uh, it produces uh, these drugs of enormous two-photon cross-section, 5,000 GM units. <coughs> Just as an aside, for those of you who are interested in quantum dots, quantum dots have two-photon cross-sections of about 50,000 units. So if you want to do a two-photon quantum dot play, uh, that's an idea. And so uh, the big problem with molecules like this is that they're not very water-soluble, but the group in Oxford worked on making a water-soluble drug. It gets into cells, and we can do two-photon killing. Uh, uh, it's, it's more effective uh, than, than, vis than uh, uh, Visudine. So <coughs> that looks as if it's going to work in vitro. Uh, what about in vivo? And so we set up this model, which is a so-called dorsal uh, window chamber model. Uh, in the mouse, you basically pull the back of the skin up uh, and uh, cut one side out. You replace the skin on one side with a glass window so you can actually look through it and see these very high resolution images, for example, of the vasculature. And uh, this shows a situation where we did two photon treatment of this single vessel. So because of this exquisite precision of targeting, you can shut down selectively a single vessel, even very close to another vessel, here it is on OCT, 
and you see you can shut that down. Lots of biology that we don't understand. How come it shuts down this whole length if you just treat that spot? Uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, and we did some multi-functional uh, uh, labeling to try to understand uh, what was going on at a biological level there. And this is a real-time video uh, where uh, <coughs> fluorescently labeled platelets uh, were uh, 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 administered to the animal. And this animal had two spots treated with 2.1 PDT. So actually what you see here is a formation of thrombus. Uh, so this is uh, thrombus formation. Uh, you see the blood flow here is uh, because it's close to this larger vessel, it's sufficient to drag off the platelets uh, wh which are aggregating at those spots. And if you make some metrics of these vascular responses, you can demonstrate, as we recently uh, uh, published, uh, that 2 photon PDT undergoes or, or, or behaves photobiologically in, in, in a sensible way because you have drug-like reciprocity. The problem is <laughs> the numbers. <laughs> So the principle works very well. The numbers kill you uh, because uh, if you look at the, this is vertiporfin two photon versus dimer. So first of all, for one photon, this is the drug-like product you need. So 6,000 in some units, that doesn't matter. You need 1,000 times that if you're going to do four to two photon with vertiporfin. And you need still uh, about 100 times, even with this dimer. Uh, so the issue here is that although there's a hundred times higher two photon cross section than the dimer, we're not actually achieving that full uh, efficacy. So we need to work more on delivery system of the dimer so that it targets the same organelles, for example, mitochondria, and, th and that work is ongoing. Nevertheless, it shows proof of principle. So on this topic, it is feasible. You can shut down blood vessels. We do need more practical, femtosecond and affordable laser sources for that. The design of drugs are available. We need to optimize the delivery. And even with these, the light dose is going to be very high. So that's the principle. What would this be used for? And so here's a list, uh, a sort of brainstorming list that we came up with of potential in vivo applications based on this precision of the targeting. And uh, I'll just let you read those. I won't go through them. But the one that we uh, elected to uh, uh, think about probably was age-related macular degeneration, <coughs> for which PDT is a standard therapy. It's now being studied in combination with anti-angiogenic drugs. And the idea here would be uh, that uh, AMD, for those of you who are not aware, is choroidal uh, neovascularization, where probably due to chronic hypoxia, uh, you get abnormal growth of the choroidal blood vessels uh, at the back of the uh, back of the retina, and this uh, essentially causes mechanical uh, uh, a disruption of the retinal layer, uh, leading to central uh, vision loss. And this is a, the the major cause of blindness in the elderly in the Western world. And uh, uh, about two million people have been treated worldwide with one photon PDT for this condition. Uh, but it's known that there. Are the problem is they, need, they require multiple treatments. And we believe that that is because of collateral damage. Because if you think about the laser beam coming in, again by analogy here, with the one photon treatment, even with good focusing, and there's a limit to the focusing you can get at the back of the eye, since, the, the, since these blood vessels are leaky, those photosensitizers are leaking out into the other layers. There's light everywhere throughout those other layers, and therefore you get collateral damage, which actually causes a vicious cycle of, 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 of response. Whereas with a two photon PDT, in principle, we should be able just to target the blood vessels. Uh, so the conceptual idea of how this would work in the clinic would be to use a confocal laser scanning ophthalmoscope. Uh, such as shown here, uh, we would couple a femtosecond laser beam into that, and we've done this. This is actually uh, a femtosecond confocal laser imaging of a uh, volunteer, graduate student in our lab, uh, uh, showing that, uh, that, that, that you can do that. And the idea was, would be that if you have a patch of neovascularization uh, shown here, that you would essentially do a raster scanning of the two photon beam across that, so it would be a sort of paint by numbers, uh, or alternatively, uh, if that took too long because of the inefficiency, you could target feeder vessels. And there is recent evidence that, in fact, AMD uh, does have significant feeder vessels, so that would be a viable approach. The uh, uh, big problem in this, or a major technical challenge, is uh, whether or not uh, 
uh, true photon PDT uh, uh, it, it will be feasible given the nonlinear optics of the eye. So now we have to think out of the box. You're no longer talking about normal optics of the eye. You're talking about the nonlinear optics of the eye, and that's completely different. So the question is, can we really achieve that, or would the nonlinear optics make the beam like that or like that, in which case we're wasting our time? And the answer was, we have no idea. It's a very complicated question. Uh, and so there's a huge amount of work going on by a collaborator at the University of Waterloo trying to understand the physics of femtosecond light propagation in, through the eye. And, and it's very complicated. There's lots of, of complicated physical uh, uh, effects going on there. For sure, we're going to have to use adaptive optics. And for sure, we're going to have to use eye tracking if this was to succeed. The other uh, uh, potential application uh, uh, that we've been thinking about would be based not on the exquisite targeting of two photon, but the fact that you're using near infrared light rather than visible light, and therefore, in principle, you have much greater penetration through tissue because of uh, being in the optical window. And again, the Montana group have recently demonstrated in an animal model uh, an uh, anti tumor effect. Uh, which they claim actually to be through two centimeters of, of, of tish overlying tissue, which if it's true is a remarkable effect. We don't understand why that would be true, but there may be some physics there that, that, that needs to be explained. And so the idea that we're presently working on, we just started this, would be to try to use uh, PDT for, for melanoma. And uh, the group in Roswell Park, and I don't actually know if Alan was involved in, in the original melanoma study at Roswell Park. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the Roswell Park group uh, 30 years ago actually showed that they tried melanoma with one photon PDT and it actually didn't work very well. Uh, and the idea there is that the high pigmentation prevents the deep penetration. So we've got some studies going on at the moment to test quantitatively the effective depth of two photon PDT in melanoma and whether or not we could actually use that uh, for, uh, for PDT treatment using a, uh, again, window chamber model with melanoma. So that's a kind of uh, uh, crazy idea <laughs> area. Uh, let me now, as a, as a second topic, talk about uh, singlet oxygen luminescence dissymmetry. And this is work that we've done over many years with Mike Patterson. And the question, the, the motivation behind this is, uh, why does PDT not always work? Okay, so I showed you this one from Alan, fantastic response. This is a patient we did many years ago, uh, which there was zero response. Didn't matter how much drug and light we threw at this guy, nothing happened. Uh, 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 Meryl Beale has shown head and neck cancer, uh, some cases of incomplete response. And we have variable response in our prostate cancer treatment that I'll show you at the end, where dark blue represents uh, a devascularization in the prostate. And in this patient, there was fantastic response. In this patient, receiving exactly the same uh, uh, dose conditions, we got this very patchy response. So uh, this is a complicated question because there are many biophysical factors involved in PDT's asymmetry, light, drug, oxygen. Uh, not only are there those factors, but they are interdependent and they're dynamic. Uh, they change during treatment. Why? Because, for instance, the light photobleaches the drug. You can see the loss of the fluorescence here. You can see the loss of the fluorescence signal. Uh, the drug affects the light. If you have too much drug, it's an absorber. It adds to the absorption of the tissue, and it's actually become self-limiting in terms of the light penetration. And of course, the light and the drug act together to deplete oxygen, either photochemically or by shutting down vasculature. And this all happens dynamically during treatment. So it's a terribly complicated process. Uh, there's been lots of work to try to develop dosimetric methods, techniques, and instruments measuring the light, the sensitizer, and the oxygen independently. Uh, there's been work, and I'll refer to this shortly, on using the bleaching as a metric uh, of, 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 of the PDT dose. What we're particularly interested in is measuring the singlet oxygen, which after all is the effector of the damage, and therefore shouldn't you just measure that directly? And uh, that if you could measure that, the singlet oxygen dissymmetry would avoid all the complexity of, of this diagram. And it is possible to do this because singlet oxygen decays back to ground state oxygen emitting light at 12, 17 nanometers in the near infrared. Problem is, 
that only about one in a hundred million molecules of singlet oxygen decays eliminating light because singlet oxygen is tremendously reactive with biological substrates, biological molecules. That's why PDT works. So it doesn't leave much left over to decay and give you a signal. Uh, and so before about the mid-1990s, there was no unequivocal demonstration of uh, singlet oxygen uh, uh, luminescence in a real normal biological system. Uh, Hamamatsu in the mid-1990s brought out a uh, photomultiplier tube that has very high quantum efficiency in the near infrared. They actually brought it out not for PDT because nobody can make money out of PDT. Uh, they brought it out as, uh, for repeater stations in uh, uh, under uh, uh, transatlantic, under ocean uh, optical telecom. Okay. Uh, which works in the near infrared. But uh, we managed to get a system, we set it up, essentially you use a pulse laser uh, to uh, give you uh, time resolved measurements and you can measure the spectrum or you can measure the time resolved single ocean luminescence system. And here's the very first examples in vivo. Uh, this is in, a, in, in an animal model showing the spectrum. So here's the signal oxygen signal sitting, this is wavelength sitting on top of the background. So this is after you add the photosensitizer. And you can measure the decay time of the signal from which you can derive the oxygen, signal oxygen lifetime. Uh, then the question was, that's good. So you have, a, you have a, an instrument that can measure this very, uh, uh, very, very weak signal. Uh, does it actually correlate with the biological response? Is it true? the singlet oxygen actually is the main effector of biological response in PDT that we've assumed for 30 years. And so we set up this study in vitro. So this is a, uh, some uh, leukemia cells, actually no particular reason to choose those other than you get high cell density, treated with ALA PP9, which is the same uh, uh, drug that Alan used very commonly in, in uh, uh, skin patients. And this is survival fraction versus light dose. And these different uh, lines here, different colors represent different fluence rates, so you have different degrees of oxygen depletion, and there's also uh, variability in the amount of drug we have in these. We didn't try to control this. Right? This was a deliberately uncontrolled experiment. Right? Asking the question, if you measure survival, does it correlate with the light? And the answer is, yeah, it correlates. The more light, the less survival, but you can never use the light as a, as a dose predictor. Uh, if you measure the singlet oxygen under each of these conditions, so here's a light dose again, singlet oxygen, you find it's also all over the place. So these different conditions, different treatment conditions in the PDT are generating different amounts of singlet oxygen. Now the big question, the six $4,000 question is, if we plot survival fraction versus singlet oxygen, what happens? And you get a beautiful curve. <laughs> right, so all that variability, all that Photophysical biological variability collapses if you measure the thing that's actually doing the damage. And you can measure the slope of that curve and actually calculate for the first time how many molecules of singlet oxygen does it actually take to kill a cell. And it's a surprisingly large number. PDT is actually not a very efficient process. Uh, and so uh, you need about 50 million molecules of singlet oxygen to have, to reduce the cell uh, uh, survival by about one of an E. And that's actually consistent if you calculate that through in vivo, it, it, it uh, hangs together. Does this work in vivo? And the answer is yes. So we did a normal mouse skin response study with different uh, fluence rates. Again, the high fluence rate, this is skin response. So the amount of uh, edema and, and inflammation so on that you produce versus the light dose. But if you give the light at a very high rate, you don't get much effect because the photochemical depletion of oxygen actually is self-limiting. So you give the same amount of light over a slow uh, rate, and, or, in other words, over a much longer time, you get a nice healthy response. You can show how that varies. This is essentially the sunburn response. And you can take the area under that curve as a metric of the, uh, of the effect. Again, the curves are all over the place. But if you collapse them together, this is the skin score versus the singlet oxygen, and you get a nice <coughs> linear response. So it does seem to work. Does it work in tumors in vivo? <laughs> Normal skin is fine, but does this actually work in tumors? And so we set up this uh, uh, model again. Uh, th this is work in progress. So I'll just show you some preliminary results. Uh, but we decided to use this same model 
uh, injected in this case with glioma cells that are transfected with both luciferase to give us bioluminescence images and with GFP to give us uh, 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 the uh, cell survival. So this tells us uh, the cells that are there and this tells us the metabolically active cells. We also use a technique called optical coherence tomography, a particular variant on that speck of variance that gives us a microvascular maps here of the, of the tumor. And so these, if you like, are the, are the dose response metrics. This is the end result. And we are all measuring uh, as the x-axis the singlet oxygen. We actually do singlet oxygen imaging, which you can imagine is not very high resolution because of the very low weak signal, and we measure the sensitizer fluorescence. So these are the x-axis. And what we're interested in is do these metrics correspond to the uh, uh, singlet oxygen in tumors? So I'll just show you this with respect to the bioluminescence because we're still analyzing the OCT images. Uh, so this is singlet oxygen during treatment. And uh, just, just pay attention, for instance, to this curve. This is the singlet oxygen. This is the cumulative. You'll notice that during this treatment, the singlet oxygen, the rate of singlet oxygen production goes down. We are depleting ground state oxygen by this treatment, and therefore you're getting less and less singlet oxygen generated. However, if you plot the BLI response, and we have a particular metric uh, for that, a change in bioluminescence versus a singlet oxygen, you can generate a nice response curve. A lot of variability here, normal biological variability, but you can produce a nice curve, and you can think of this the other way, of the singlet oxygen versus the response grouped into control, no response, moderate response, and high response. And these are statistically significantly different. So the singlet oxygen dissymmetry does appear to be predictive of the tumor response. We've used singlet oxygen as a gold standard in a number of studies, so accepting that this is a valid metric of PDT uh, does. We've used it as a gold standard, for example, in the validation of PDT molecular beacons, where the idea is that you make a structure such that the photosensitizer is linked to a quencher by a linker that is biologically cleavable, for example, a uh, peptide uh, uh, or an enzyme uh, linker, uh, where you can break this enzyme when you break it the sensitizer and the quencher fly apart, so you have uh, basically biological activation of the photosensitizer. And the question is, does that work? And so we are measured singlet oxygen here uh, in, the, in the quenched state, in the unquenched state, and then again inhibited. So the singlet oxygen luminescence has been very useful as a quantitative way for us to see whether this sort of rather complex uh, 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 concept will work. Uh, we've used it to look at if the drug, for instance, ALA, PP9, is localized in the mitochondria compared with the cell membrane, is there an intrinsic difference? Does it matter where the drug is in the cell? And it matters a lot. So here is the same uh, uh, amount of, 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 of photosensitizer if it's localized in the mitochondria versus plasma membrane, again, using the singlet oxygen here as a gold standard uh, dose response. And work with, that we did with Roswell Park uh, that was not yet published, uh, where they're interested in a particular molecular marker of damage, a STAT3 cross-linkage. Uh, again, we showed that you could measure the single auction and then correlate it with that molecular marker. So at all levels, at the vascular level, the cellular level, the molecular level, this appears to be a good dose technique. The problem is it has enormous number of limitations, <laughs> both technical and fundamental. And I won't go through these in details, but just to point out that, you know, this is a, a complicated piece of technology to get working. Uh, there are some advances. A group in Boston have developed a uh, diode laser-based system uh, and, and have demonstrated that that works quite well. And we very recently uh, talked, actually just last week, uh, with a group in Toronto who have developed a very clever nanowire quantum dot structure uh, that actually may have something like 100% uh, 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 quantum efficiency in this part of the spectrum. It's a long way from the clinic yet, but it's very, very promising and exciting. However, the reality is a single oxygen dissymmetry is painful <laughs> right, because the signal is so low. And so in the spirit of preferring simpler things, and if you can't read it back, it says, I prefer the simpler things in life, men. Uh, um, uh, uh, 
we would like to ask the question, are there, are there better ways of doing the symmetry? <coughs> and Tom Foster, who was the first uh, uh, of these uh, lecturers uh, uh, a couple of years ago from Rochester, and this is Tom giving his first Osterhof lecture here, uh, he uh, and, uh, worked with Alan very closely on using photo bleaching. I mentioned the photo bleaching. The principle here is you give the drug, you give the light, if you know that the light bleaches the drug, if nothing happens, then nothing has happened. <laughs> right? If a lot happens, then a lot should have happened. So the question is, and, and Alan and Tom and the, and, 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 and the group have used this very effectively for ALA PP9 in the, pa in the patients, measuring the photo bleaching of the curves uh, in each of these lesions being treated in, 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 in this patient. So it works very nicely with, with, with ALA. So we thought we would ask, uh, could we use single oxygen luminescence dissymmetry to validate this approach to photo bleaching? It seems to work, but does it always work? And I won't go through the details of this, but essentially you're monitoring the changes in fluorescence with photo bleaching. Uh, this change in fluorescence should be proportional to the singlet oxygen produced and, and therefore proportional to the PDT dose. And you can do some algebra to show the relationship here. And Mike Patterson at McMaster has shown very nicely in cell work that if you measure the uh, survival fraction versus the singlet oxygen calculated from the photo bleaching, not measured directly, you get these beautiful curves. However, all is not well. Uh, because if you take the same tumor and you look at how the fluorescence bleaches and you measure the single oxygen, it looks, oh, that's all right, they're both going down. But in fact, they're going down at a completely different rate. So there's something wrong here. And the question is, what's wrong? Is it always a robust metric? So we recently did a study uh, with uh, the drug MTHPC, again in our cell system, and this shows the fluorescence signal as you give the treatment under different conditions. And something very funny happens here because look at this curve. What on earth has happened there? Now this is a photo bleaching curve. It should be a nice single exponential as the drug is photo bleached, and yet there's these kinks all over this curve. It's also not always single exponential. So that was very worrisome, and it turns out that this is not just an artifact of this model, because uh, the group at UPenn have reported in vivo in skin, also with this drug, that they see the same effect of a sudden kink in the photo bleaching curve. So it's very uh, uh, odd. And so in this system, we were able to simultaneously measure the oxygen and the singlet oxygen. And it turns out that what happens is you're depleting the oxygen in the suspension. The singlet oxygen is going up while you have ground state oxygen, but then it flattens off. This corresponds to this kink in the curve. So this tells you that with this drug, when you reach very low oxygen, the photophysics completely changes. <coughs> And the relationship between the photo bleaching dose that you'd measure and the singlet oxygen actually falls apart. They completely decorrelate under hypoxia. Can this be rescued? I had a much ruder uh, 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 slide of someone being rescued down a fire, fire escape, but I thought I'd remove it for this refined audience. Uh, <laughs> so uh, can this be rescued? And uh, we, thought, uh, we thought, oh my goodness, this means you cannot use, you cannot use photo bleaching dissymmetry for, MPD, uh, for uh, MTHPC, which is an important drug for head and neck cancer. And so we were measuring the fluorescence, of course, of the drug, because that's what we're doing for the photo bleaching, but we were doing full spectroscopy, and this shows you why you should always use the most expensive instrumentation you can in the early days of any experiment because uh, you you know, otherwise you'd miss unexpected things. And it turns out if we look at this, right on this edge of the MTHPC fluorescence, there starts to appear a new peak at 613 nanometers. And that new peak starts to appear right at that kink. So when you deplete the oxygen, something happens 
So the photophysics of this molecule, and you completely change the situation, this is reversible with the addition of oxygen. So it's not a photoproduct. This is not a photoproduct, otherwise it would not reverse when you added back oxygen. We think it may be an excimer state. In other words, because the oxygen is very low, the triplet lifetime of the photosensitive molecule is very long, and so you have a chance for collisional interactions, either between the singlet states or between the singlet triplet states or between the triplet triplet states. So we think this is an excimer uh, type reaction. And the point is that this can now be rescued because we can use that 613 as the traffic light. In other words, when you start to see the 613 signal, you have to stop the treatment because you're not generating any more sigma oxygen. Even although the photobleaching tells you that the treatment is still being successful. So a nice example, I think, of, 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 of the use of sigma oxygen as, as a metric. Okay, third topic, PDT in bone. <coughs> so, as I said at the beginning, this was uh, uh, a project that happened when, uh, uh, when an orthopedic resident, Shane Birch, came into my office in, one day and said, I've got this crazy idea, Can, could we use PDT in bone? And I said, for what? And he said, for treatment of vertebral metastases. So, lots of tumors lead to, uh, 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 primary tumors lead to cancer in the vertebral column. It's a major problem uh, with uh, uh, 18,000 cases of vertebral meds per year. Uh, problems are mechanical instability, uh, severe pain, etc. Uh, patients are often immobilized. Current therapies, uh, while they can be useful in terms of pain management, actually do nothing uh, to, to, uh, to, to treat the underlying condition, of which is mechanical instability of the, of, of, of the spine. So there are two surgical techniques, analogous, called vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, uh, which attempt to mechanically stabilize the vertebra. And the idea is essentially, just as you have something, uh, you, you know, I used to have an old Volkswagen that was mostly glass, fiberglass uh, uh, repair kit uh, 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 and very little metal left. And the same idea is that you'll try to rescue the mechanical stability here by either injecting plastic, uh, acrylic, uh, polyacrylamide, or by, by putting a balloon in uh, to give mechanical stabilization. The problem is, in many cases, you can't get the plastic in because the tumor is space occupying. And so the, the hypothesis was, could we use PDT to debulk the tumor in these vertebrae so that you could actually use these surgical techniques? Uh, so lots of questions arise. Can PDT kill the metastatic cells? What is that sensitizer? How would you deliver this? Is there a negative effect, a very important effect? question, is there a negative effect on bone integrity? Can you do it safely because you're very close to the spinal cord? So we set up, first of all, a rat model. This was a, a metastatic rat model where you inject tumor cells into the heart and they spread everywhere, including along the spine. Uh, we did treatments, uh, delivering uh, optical fiber into the specific vertebra, used bioluminescence monitoring to show the difference, and indeed, uh, you get a nice anti-tumor effect. So you can kill tumor in the vertebral column. Uh, oh, uh, just as a, 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 a matter of interest, this was with BPD. ALA was actually anti-selective, much to our surprise. <laughs> we thought ALA was the right one to use for this, and we did the initial studies. We actually found the spinal cord had a higher concentration of TP9 than the tumor, which was a big surprise to us. Uh, we then moved on to pig and dog models to try to develop the technique uh, 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 as a real uh, surgical technique. This was done a number of years ago. I'm going to skip that video. Uh, but it showed that you can do it. We developed a patented uh, device uh, uh, to, to be able to do combined uh, uh, PDT and vertebroplasty. You then ask the question, can you solve it very well killing little microgram bits of tumor in a rat? Can you kill a decent amount of tumor with PDT? And so we used as a, as a uh, canine clinical trial uh, done at UC Davis, uh, we showed that we could treat very substantive volumes of, in this case, sarcoma in, 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 in the long bone uh, of, of dogs that are susceptible to that disease. So that looked pretty good. 
The next question that was very important to us, and, uh, and, and the pig and dog study showed us that we could do this without causing paralysis or other, other effects on the spinal cord, uh, was we were worried that we would actually make the bone strength worse. Uh, and so we set up a study looking at the effect of PDT either alone or in combination with other therapies, radiation or bisphosphonates, to, on the structural integrity. Complicated set of experiments in which we did many different uh, uh, assays of effect on bone, uh, both uh, physio uh, metabolic assays, also we did micro CT to look at structure, we did, uh, we did compression uh, strength, we did strain imaging, etc. Surprising to us, and this was, was really unexpected, was that PDT actually increases normal bone strength and structure. And it if you combine PDT with uh, bisphosphonase, it restores tumor bearing vertebral to normal control levels. Quite significant and surprising result. Um, we think the reason for this, and we've got some studies ongoing at the moment that I don't have time to go into. Uh, that we think that, that this is happening is that the PDT actually changes the osteoblast-osteoclast balance. So there is selective uh, 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 killing of osteoclasts relevant relative to the osteoblast population. So this just summarizes this. We're just about to start a phase one clinical trial. We've got all the pieces together, IRB approval, so we're expecting to start any day. We've been starting to look at use of uh, MMP, uh, matrix metalloproteinase based PDT beacons to further improve the selectivity and that, that, that work is ongoing. But also importantly, there's been at least three spin-offs from this. I showed you the treatment of sarcoma, but we've also looked at treatment of osteomyelitis. Now that we're confident we can do PDT in bone, how about treating bone infection? And because of those effects of the positive uh, uh, influence of PDT on bone growth, we've been thinking about using this for bone growth modulation and accelerated fracture healing. So this just shows the animal studies in osteomyelitis where we uh, put a biofilm on a, on a wire inside one of the long bones, do bioluminescence imaging. This one was treated. This is the self-control. You see you can kill uh, a Staph aureus in the long bones uh, with, with PDT. And it's interesting that, in fact, uh, this comes back to the origins of PDT because the origin of PDT was nothing to do with cancer. It was the observation uh, of, of, of uh, uh, acridine orange uh, in, in dishes of paramecia left in the sunlight uh, was anti-infective. And so it's a nice sort of loop back to the original history of this subject. And we've got a study that's just started, supported by DOD, the U.S. Army is supporting this, uh, to actually try to use PDT to accelerate uh, fracture healing. So this is their interest there is for battlefield medicine, obviously. So finally, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go five minutes. I want to talk about PDD, uh, making surgery a quantitative science using fluorescence-guided tumor resection. So this says, uh, damn it, I'm a brain surgeon, not a rocket scientist. This started actually as a spin-off from our PDT glioma work because uh, when Paul Mueller and, and uh, we uh, first started doing PDT in brain for treatment of glioma, we were using photofrin. We were very interested to see whether or not we could measure the amount of photofrin that's actually in the tumor. And so we built this honking great camera uh, uh, to do <laughs> fluorescence imaging. Uh, it was optically extremely elegant, uh, cost a fortune. Uh, when we tried to commercialize it, we were told that it was unmanufacturable, <laughs> which is an interesting lesson for graduate students. Just because you can make something doesn't mean it's manufacturable. Uh, and I can talk about the reasons for that. Anyway, we used this. Uh, in the OR, and here's looking down into a brain tumor patient after all the tumor had been removed with the surgeon. So this patient is about to be closed up because the surgeon had removed, and this is with MRI guidance, the surgeon had removed all of the tumor that was visible, and you look in fluorescence, and there's all the tumor that's left behind. And you know there's tumor left behind in these patients because 100% of them recur locally. So this is not a surprise, but the positive thing is that you can see it with fluorescence. And 
another observation uh, that, that we've made in our lab uh, comes back to ALA because it turns out that if you look at ALA PP9 and the, and the whole heme biosynthesis pathway on which it's based, it turns out that, that ALA uh, PP9 is highly selective for tumor in brain. Uh, there's very, very little uh, 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 PP9 uh, synthesis in, in white matter where 80% of adult gliomas uh, occur. And so there's very good intrinsic selectivity here. Uh, so uh, it's a little behind us, but in parallel, a group in uh, Germany, uh, Stumer, uh, used this technique uh, to do uh, fluorescent surgical guidance <coughs> in, in uh, glioma patients. Uh, Zeiss and also now Leica have incorporated fluorescence imaging into their uh, neurosurgical microscopes. And the uh, Stumer group uh, did a large 11 center trial of over 300 patients this is the uh, Kaplan-Meier survival uh, uh, curves, uh, showing that there was a difference in, in fluorescence guide resection. Uh, although those curves don't look that different, it's important to note that the addition of fluorescence guidance to this normal surgery increased uh, progression-free survival by four months, which is significant in these groups, as I'm sure uh, Henry will tell you and uh, increased progression-free survival at six months by 41% compared with 21%. Uh, so it looks very positive, but there's still uh, uh, a distance to go here uh, because there are a couple of major limitations on this study. One is that the assessment of the fluorescence, the decision of the neurosurgeon as to what to cut, uh, was purely subjective and qualitative. And secondly, this only seemed to work for high-grade uh, 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 GBM. And so we thought we'd look at that question. In particular, I'm going to talk briefly about the quantitative question. If you think about this from an engineering perspective, the detection of that residual brain tumor is actually a problem in signal detection. You're trying to detect a fluorescence signal that the surgeon can then use to, to make a decision. Uh, and this is a, a, a very challenging problem for, for fluorescence, as illustrated here. This is a set of nine gel phantoms all with the same amount of fluorescent dye in them. Okay. This is what the surgeon sees. The difference between these phantoms is the difference in the absorption and the scattering properties of the tissue. So seeing a certain level of fluorescence tells you that there's fluorescence there, but it tells you almost nothing about how much fluorescence is there. And so for the neurosurgeon to make a decision that the fluorescence is above a threshold that indicating a high probability of tumor is, is almost impossible. And so uh, we asked the question, is there some way in which we could make accurate, absolute local concentration measurements of whatever the fluorophore was, in this case, ALA PP9? So we developed this uh, point spectroscopy system, uh, which uh, is based on a number of optical fibers, uh, one of which does the fluorescence measurement, and the other two measure diffuse reflectance from the tissue. Uh, and from that, uh, since each of those is done with full spectral discrimination, is able to extract the optical properties at every wavelength. And so you can then uh, use a model knowing the optical absorption spectrum and the scattering spectrum from that diffuse reflection signal. You can solve for the quantitative fluorescence spectrum and then once you have the quantitative fluorescence spectrum, you can spectrally unmix to extract the important thing, which is the PP9 <laughs> concentration. That was validated in phantoms. These are the range of apparent fluorescence under those different phantom conditions. This is the range of true fluorescence corrected for those optical properties after you apply the technique. And so this shows this uh, system being used in the clinic uh, during uh, surgery. Uh, at Dartmouth College. This is actually for a meningioma, so it's not particularly representative of the gliomas, but it just shows you how the method's used. You see the little flash of light there, the little flash of white light uh, that's measuring the diffuse reflectance. And so the surgeon takes that and makes a measurement once you're, you don't need it to see this, but once the surgeon is down in the tumor bed and asking is there still What's, I see a little fluorescence there. How much fluorescence is that? Is, is that still likely to be tumor? They can make the measurements. 
And uh, so here are uh, th uh, three cases uh, with the high-grade glioma. And you see the nice fluorescent spectrum. This is absolute. You notice that you can actually calculate the number of micrograms per mil. This is a ridiculous number of significant figures. It's not true. Uh, but <laughs> it's about two uh, micrograms per mil. Uh, but it has about a, uh, a plus or minus 10% accuracy. Uh, so that's interesting, not surprising. This was the very surprising one to us. Here's low-grade glioma. Mm -hmm. Nothing is visible on the Zeiss fluorescence imaging system. You take the probe, you make a measurement, there's the fluorescence. And so when we look at that, this is the absolute fluorescence measurement measured in vivo, controls in the normal brain. This is logarithmic note, uh, all tumors together, low grade, high grade, meningioma, metastatic uh, intracranial lesions. You can make these measurements in the individual patients and you do a, 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 a sensitivity specificity analysis in high-grade high glioma patients. The addition of the quantitative PP9 measurement from the probe significantly increases the sensitivity <coughs> and the specificity. If you also use the fact that you're measuring the full diffuse reflectance spectrum, and this is like work that's, that's going on here, so you can get the hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, oxygen saturation in the tissue, it increases it even further. And so we're just about to start a large scale, about 200 patient trial on that. And that whole idea of fluorescence guided surgery is now being applied uh, in head and neck tumor in our, in our program, head and neck tumors, I'm sorry, I've lost there, <coughs> in prostate and in breast. So my own bias here is a fluorescence image guided surgery, tumor surgery, particularly if you can make it quantitative, is actually going to be game-changing for, for surgical oncology. Doesn't replace any of the other techniques, but once you're down there, at the margin, you need something like this to know what to cut. Okay, because we're running out of time, I'll spend one slide on prostate cancer, because I just wanted to end with stuff where we've done a lot clinically. Uh, I'm surprised that the ladies in the audience understand this. I thought only the guys would understand this, this cartoon. Uh, anyway, we've done fairly extensive clinical trials using a uh, photosensitizer developed at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. We developed a lot of technology around this to be able to do PDT in the prostate analogously to brachytherapy in the prostate. We developed treatment planning for that. We ran that through dog studies, phase one study, phase two study, I showed you that already. And the bottom line is this curve. So the idea here is vascularly targeted PDT for prostate cancer attempted to treat the whole prostate. This cohort of patients are patients who had failed definitive radiotherapy. So these patients had had prior radiation therapy <coughs> and had local recurrence. At that stage, really, there's nothing to do with these patients other than sort of hormonal maintenance uh, type therapy. Uh, complicated study uh, required very extensive and very expensive uh, uh, MRI uh, uh, follow-up. The, the, this actually cost about $25,000 per patient because we had such intensive uh, monitoring. But the bottom line is shown in this curve. This is so-called D90, light dose. We determined a metric of the light dose that we're delivering to the prostate, where the prostate, at least 90% of the planned volume of the prostate would receive that light dose or higher. Mm -hmm. So it's so, so a lower limit. It's kind of analogous to, 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 to a radiotherapy uh, uh, to type metric. So that's the D90. And this is the fraction of patients who were biopsy negative at six months. So big is good here because it means it's minus negative. And you notice, as we increase the D90, at low D90, we have lots of, essentially, recurrences. We're not killing all the cancer here. However, once we get above about 30 joules per square centimeter, we have a situation where 8 out of 15 of these patients treated with an adequate dose were biopsy negative for 6 months. 
And remember, these are patients who had failed definitive radiation therapy. So we thought that was actually kind of a spectacular result for a phase 2A trial. And we were hoping to continue that trial uh, to do a phase 2B and then a, and then a phase 3 study. But for, for uh, commercial, political, uh, uh, economic reasons, uh, that's not happening, at least with this particular agent. And so I wanted to get to this point because I wanted just to say that we're about to start a, a collaborative clinical trial with Steve Han, who was the second <laughs> author of lecturer. So there's a little, little serendipity here, and this shows, uh, I guess, picture taken last year. Uh, so we are about to start a joint clinical trial uh, with the UPenn group uh, on um, trying to push to the next stage uh, of using um, uh, vascularly targeted PDT for whole prostate and radiation failure patients uh, uh, in, into phase three uh, with the expectation that if that's successful, and I think it has a very high chance of being successful, uh, we are then strongly positioned to move potentially into the use of this modality for primary prostate cancer. So uh, I'd just like to end by acknowledging, uh, obviously, this has been many years' work, and there's be, the, the list of people would be enormous, so I won't even attempt it. I'll just uh, thank these uh, different groups of individuals who've contributed uh, the real work here. And I actually wanted to end with a thanks to uh, um, another two individuals. <laughs> and this is a little history. I wanted to thank Ed Profio and Dan Doyle. Because when I first came, moved to Canada from Australia, I had been doing radiological physics, actually, nuclear medicine and radiotherapy and CT and stuff. Uh, and I came across this paper that they wrote in medical physics called Dissymmetric Considerations in Phototherapy. And if you read that paper, it's not actually a research paper. You don't actually show any results. <laughs> it's a paper discussing the challenges in this new emerging uh, uh, modality. Uh, and I thought, that's really interesting. Uh, I wonder if I could do that. And so I went down to uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, Ed was a uh, professor, very senior professor at Santa Barbara. He passed away a number of years ago. Um, and Dan Doyron was a graduate student. And Dan Doyron uh, drove me from Santa Barbara down to, or is it down, or, yeah, down to LA to meet with Chuck Gomer who some of you may know at the University of Southern California. And Dan was just finishing his PhD, and he was struggling with whether or not to stay in academia. And Ed had offered him a uh, junior faculty position at UCSB, which is pretty nice, uh, or to start a company. And so he was asking me my advice, and I said, Dad, you know, take the faculty position. You're crazy. I mean, just, <laughs> you know, university faculty, you know, tenure track faculty positions, University of Santa Barbara has got its own surfing beach. You know, you're set up for life. Anyway, Dad decided to ignore my advice, and he set up a company called, originally called PDT Inc. That morphed into um, uh, a much larger company. Uh, Dan uh, jumped out with $40 million and is now running a pedigree cattle ranch in the hills of Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he got me started on this, and he's no longer doing it. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, uh, what a nice story. So just to finalize, you know, PDT, in a way, started with a Nobel Prize in medicine. Uh, not quite, but, uh, uh, you know, Finson won the Nobel Prize, one of the very early Nobel Prize, uh, for the uh, recognition of his contribution to the treatment of diseases with concentrated light radiation, whereby he opened up a new avenue for medical sciences. And, uh, I wanted to just uh, uh, finally say that Alan, uh, as a colleague and friend, uh, pushed the boundaries of that, of that idea uh, enormously. I also wanted <coughs> just uh, to uh, acknowledge uh, that we've also lost two other luminaries uh, to other shining lights and pioneers in the area of photomedicine in the last year, uh, namely Britain Chance, and this shows Britain getting married for, I don't know, fifth time or something? Uh, <laughs> third time, whatever, uh, 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 just a few months before his death, uh, which is a very nice uh, picture, uh, and, and uh, Michael Feld at MIT, uh, and uh, there's a nice connection here with Alan because both Alan and I were on Michael Feld's advisory board, and so Alan and I used to go out drinking and see how rotten the science was at Michael Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fantastic, and so there was a very nice interaction between us. <laughs>
So with that, I'd like to thank you again for the honor of inviting me to the third Oslo Lecture. Thank you.